The chief executive talks to Yunlong residents to collect opinions ahead of his policy address. 43 injured in a traffic accident involving a KMB bus and a truck on Moon Road. And North Korean leader Kim Jong-un visits a university in the Russian city of Vladivostok. Hello and welcome to TVB News. Chief Executive John Lee visited the community again today to tap more views for his upcoming policy address. After his visit to some subdivided units in Yunlong, the CE said land and housing will always remain front and center in the government's agenda, and the administration is studying ways to improve subdivided flat tenants' living conditions. After Friday's district tour in Chunwan, Chief Executive John Lee met with residents in Yunlong today. His first stop was this tenement building. Accompanied by Secretary for Home Affairs Alice Mack and Secretary for Housing Winnie Ho, John Lee chatted with a family of four in this 100-square-foot subdivided flat for around half an hour. <laughs> then he headed to Yunlong New Street. CE, please look over here, this butcher said. Deputy Chief Secretary for Administration Warner Chirk briefed the CE on their progress to tackle the area's hygiene black spots. Some photo ops for Yunlong residents. The CE told residents they could tell their opinions to their district's Home Affairs Department or community care team when the squad is established. He then went to a tea house and talked with patrons in a pre-marked area. Both adults and children. This patron said the CE asked her about the city's nighttime economy, and she admitted she seldom heads out and was exhorted by John Lee to try dining out more. Meeting the press after the district tour, the CE said the administration is studying ways to take action to tackle the least ideal living conditions in Hong Kong. He stressed land and housing issues will be the government's long-term focus. Chief Executive John Lee also said today it will take time to revitalize the city's nighttime economy. Lee's comment came after the Night Vibes Hong Kong campaign was launched three days ago. Mimo Sengai reports. With the Night Vibes Hong Kong campaign being launched on Thursday, some shopping malls have already extended their opening hours and organized nighttime activities such as music performances. However, many shops have continued their old routines, closing early. Speaking to the press today, Chief Executive John Lee said the nighttime economy project will take time to achieve its goals. He said he understands the challenges behind the project, including changing local residents' habits after the three-year pandemic. However, the CE said he has faith in Hong Kongers and knows they are flexible and clever. Speaking on the TVB program, Executive Council member Jeffrey Lam believes the events of the campaign must be creative and diverse for it to be successful. He added that the campaign is going in the right direction. I think we should be positive in looking, you know, this night market idea going forward. Uh, but we cannot using the same strategy every week, not only to attract uh, local people. How can we also attract, uh, you know, people from Shenzhen or other parts of the world? Maybe we should add some new elements like uh, AI concert, VR activities. Young people, even old people, are interested in those kind of things. So if we just extend the sh uh, shopping hours for two hours, it's not enough. Singing is not enough. So maybe some high-tech things that people don't get to watch, don't get to see, don't get to learn when they're at home watching TV. The retail sector expressed concerns over the timing of the campaign, saying it will worsen the issue of insufficient manpower. Lam, meanwhile, thinks the campaign is a timely measure. He disagreed with the views that the government should have waited for the arrival of imported laborers before launching the nightlife plan, saying that would be delaying the recovery process of the city's economy. Mimus 9, TVB News. 
43 people were injured in a traffic collision between a Kowloon motor bus double-decker and a boom truck on Tu Moon Road. One person sustained serious injuries. The police said the KMB driver began work in the early hours and believe he was on the fourth round of his route at the time of the crash. Timothy Lee tells us more. The two vehicles, a 58M double-decker traveling from Luenkang Estate to Kwaifan Station and a boom truck, could be seen parked on the side of the road after the incident. The front of the bus was almost entirely crushed, partially wrapping around the back of the truck. The double-decker's interior was in a mangled state. Authorities received reports at around 1 p.m. of the Canby double-decker colliding with a boom truck at a section of Tumun Road near Sealand. Many passengers were trapped on the bus, including the driver who required emergency care to the neck and other passengers were carried out on stretchers. Some on board the double-decker noted the vehicle was traveling at a normal speed. This passenger said she heard a sudden bang and saw two passengers lying on the floor behind her. One of them bled from the cheek. This man was staring at his phone at the time of the crash and said he suffered neck injuries. The truck driver said he parked his vehicle on the side of the road after it was suspected to have broken down before the double-decker rammed it from behind. Owing to the serious collision, the affected section of Tu Moon Road remains cordoned off. The police noted, according to their investigation, the KMB driver was not at work yesterday and only began driving this morning at around 4 and was driving his fourth round of his route by the time of the collision. Authorities are still uncertain whether the driver suffers from health issues and called upon witnesses to step up and provide more information. Timothy Lee, TVB News. A train carrying North Korean leader Kim Jong-un has reportedly left the railway station in Russia's far eastern city of Artyom bound for home, wrapping up his visit to Russia. Russian news agencies reported today. The distance from Artyom to Kasan station on Russia's border with North Korea is more than 200 kilometers. During his visit, Kim met Russian President Vladimir Putin on Wednesday and discussed the prospect of enhanced military cooperation between the two countries. Nasmi Karim with more. Later that day, he built the Mariinsky Theatre in Vladivostok for a ballet performance of Tchaikovsky's Sleeping Beauty. Today, it was academia as Kim visited the Far Eastern Federal University. In a video released by Russia's Minister of Natural Resources, Kim is seen walking around the university campus, accompanied by the governor of the Russian Primorsky region, Oleg Kozemyako. It is said that North Korean students are studying at the university in Vladivostok. He was then seen in a video from state-run RIA news agency walking along red carpet to a train carriage in Artyom, reportedly on his way home. According to North Korean state media's KCNA, Kim and Shoigu discussed practical issues to boosting military cooperation in what Pyongyang is calling a fresh heyday in bilateral relations. On Wednesday, Kim met Russian President Vladimir Putin, holding four hours of talks that also involved military cooperation. With Moscow keen to hold joint military drills with North Korea, the U.S. and its allies are concerned about the burgeoning relationship. The U.S., though, has warned both Pyongyang and Moscow that any North Korean weapon supplies to aid Russia's war with Ukraine would violate United Nations sanctions and trigger reprisals. Putin has already said he would abide by U.N. sanctions, while Pyongyang has previously said it would never sell weapons to Russia. However, Mark Milley, the U.S. chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, said North Korea would likely provide Russia with Soviet-era artillery rounds, which he believes would not make much of a difference in Moscow's campaign in Ukraine. Experts say military cooperation may also mean Russia helping North Korea to modernize its outdated air force, which relies on Soviet warplanes from the 1980s. Nazvi Karim, TVB News. Ukraine says it has recaptured a settlement in the war ravaged East as it continues its counteroffensive against Russian forces. Kyiv says it has taken the village of Andrivka, around 10 kilometers south of Bakhmut in the Donetsk region, while Russia says it has thwarted coordinated Ukrainian attacks on Crimea and drone attacks on Moscow. Meanwhile, two major historical sites in Ukraine have been placed on the UNESCO's list of World Heritage Sites in Danger. 
The iconic St. Sophia Cathedral in Kyiv and the medieval center of the western city of Lvov are UNESCO World Heritage Sites central to Ukraine's culture and history, the UN says. Friday's decision at the 45th session of the World Heritage Committee held in Saudi Arabia has no enforcement mechanism, but could help deter Russian attacks. Neither site has been directly targeted since Russia invaded Ukraine in February 2022. And Lvov has largely been spared from the fighting. But Russia has unleashed waves of strikes on Kyiv and other cities. In January, UNESCO added Ukraine's Black Sea port city of Odessa to its list of endangered heritage sites. And still ahead... Libya launches an investigation into the collapse of two dams as rescue and relief efforts continue after devastating floods. The largest freshwater lake in the UK and Ireland being poisoned by an algae boom. And the EU's top envoy in the city says the bloc is reluctant to decouple from any country. Welcome back. Libyan authorities have opened an investigation into the collapse of two dams that caused devastating floods in the coastal city of Derna. The dams burst as a result of a torrent unleashed by Storm Daniel that recently hit the area. As international aid continues to arrive in the country, rescue teams were still searching for bodies Saturday, nearly a week after the deluge killed more than 11,300 people and left 10,000 missing. Tracy Furness has more. Aerial images filmed Saturday show the devastation left by the collapse of two dams in the city of Derna. The floods overwhelmed the two dams, sending a wall of water several metres high through the centre of the city. Entire neighbourhoods have been destroyed and people swept out to sea. 10,000 people are still missing as rescue workers continue to search for bodies. A Maltese rescue team found around 400 bodies on a beach in Derna Friday. The Prime Minister of Libya's eastern government said Friday that areas affected by flooding in Derna will be isolated. The World Health Organization sent 29 metric tons of health supplies from their global logistics hub in Dubai. The supplies include medicine, trauma and emergency surgery supplies and medical equipment, enough to help around 250,000 people. Libyan public prosecutor al Sadek al-Sur said prosecutors would investigate the collapse of the two dams, which were built in the 1970s, as well as the allocation of maintenance funds. He told a news conference that whoever made mistakes of negligence will have a criminal case brought against him and a trial. Tracy Furness, TVB News. The remnants of Hurricane Lee have made landfall in Nova Scotia, Canada, after bringing destructive winds and torrential rain to parts of New England in the U.S. and Atlantic Canada. The storm has left plenty of damage behind. Tens of thousands of people were without power Saturday as strong winds felled power lines. At least one death was reported after a tree fell on a man's vehicle in Maine. More in this NBC News report. Post-tropical cyclone Lee, no longer a hurricane, but still packing a punch for New England. High tide, boat canvases ripping, you know, falling off and other boats breaking free and smashing into the boats. Starting early this morning, south of Boston, swells of wind-whipped waves were seen battering beaches and hammering homes. Wind got so strong it toppled trees, one crushing this police cruiser. Up and down the northeast coast, dangerous rip currents tearing through the Atlantic. I think the only time I've ever seen swell like this is in the nor'easter in the wintertime. In New Jersey, a desperate search for a missing boater who disappeared late Thursday when his boat capsized in strong surf. Lee, once a Category 5 hurricane just last week, remains the largest storm of this year's Atlantic hurricane season, with cloud bands stretching 800 miles. In Bar Harbor, Maine, fishermen taking precautions to protect their boats and their tools. Normally on a Saturday in September, this would be covered with boats, upwards of 100. You can see most of them have taken to safer waters. 
At the height of the storm, two lobstermen took this tiny skiff across unforgiving waters, desperate to save their damaged boat and their livelihood. For people used to nor'easters, but unfamiliar with hurricanes, faced with their very first watch in over a decade, Lee's weakening was welcome. The largest freshwater lake in the UK and Ireland, Loch Nee, is being poisoned by a toxic blue-green algae that is killing its fish, birds and dogs. Locals have serious concerns about the health of the lake, which provides Northern Ireland with 40 percent of its drinking water. An environment officer said the lake is in a state of emergency. Campaigners say the lake is dying as vast algae blooms choke the life out of wildlife. A study shows the temperature of the water in the lake has risen by one degree Celsius since 1995, and an invasive zebra mussel species could be contributing factors to the toxic algae. Amid an increasingly fraught geopolitical situation, European Union Ambassador to Hong Kong Thomas Nyoki told TVB News the bloc is reluctant to decouple from any country. The top EU envoy in the SAR also said European companies here are setting their sights on stepping up trade ties with Hong Kong. You are in the Having been posted to the SAR for three years, head of the EU office to Hong Kong Thomas Nyoki spoke with Chief Executive John Lee last month alongside 13 European Consul's General or Representatives. This is really a good opportunity to exchange views on a number of political topics uh, and uh, economic topics which are of, uh, of interest to both sides. For example, the, the implementation of national security law. After mainland Chinese companies, EU companies are the largest business com foreign business community in uh, Hong Kong. Uh, so so uh, European companies want to participate in this opening up again of, of Hong Kong. So a lot of the discuss discussion was about how that can happen. As China's Belt and Road Initiative just marked its 10-year anniversary, 27 European countries have so far signed related documents under the program. Earlier this month, the G20 summit announced the establishment of the India-Middle-East-Europe Economic Corridor, seen by some as a spice route to challenge China's Belt and Road, with several overlapping members. Recently, the only G7 nation in the China-led initiative, Italy, is also considering quitting the Belt and Road. Belt and Road is, is about connectivity. There can be complementarity uh, between what, uh, what, what the EU is trying to do uh, in, uh, in terms in particular of the global uh, gateway. The EU's global gateway program introduced in late 2021 has pledged 300 billion euros over a seven-year period to help developing countries green and digital transformation, including African and Latin American countries from the EU that there's, there's no intention of decoupling and this, this, this is probably not even possible. So it's a question of uh, balancing certain, certain risks that may, there may be, whether this is about uh, supply chains or economic security. Thomas Nyaki also told us Hong Kong and the EU share the same objective of achieving carbon neutrality by 2050. And that very objective would allow EU companies to offer added value and their expertise in environmental technology to Hong Kong, as well as more possibility for collaboration. A man was injured after falling off a cliff in Sai Kung around midday. The 37-year-old was unconscious when he was sent to hospital. Earlier, the police received a report about the man taking a boat trip with his family before slipping while hiking around Wan Chao's Sea Palace. He was rescued by his family and was taken to hospital. Some pediatricians are predicting a rise in meningitis cases in the aftermath of the COVID pandemic, warning of the possibility of death within 24 hours of infection. Pediatric groups in the city note that five cases of meningococcus have been reported in the first eight months of this year and urge residents, especially infants, to get vaccinated. They said those with low immunity are at high risk, including infants and the elderly, and that the disease is primarily transmitted via droplets and secretion. The pediatric experts said common symptoms include bruises, while infants may see a protrusion at the soft spot of their skull. The medical school of the University of Hong Kong suggested the government offer clear vaccine guidelines for residents and announce updates on case numbers. 
And that's the news. Thank you for watching.